This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Good evening. It's Wednesday, and it's 9 p.m., and it is time, the new time, for the Toby Payne Cook and Edward Finch Late Late Chat Show. Here we are. Good evening, Ed. Uh, good evening. Good evening. New coming in in a minute. Um, ha- um, are we all right? We're all together and yeah. uh, very good. Ready to go. This is Teachers Talk Radio and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Ah, uh, this is the first time oh. the full tune. I've just done test run from yes. my spare room, mother's spare room, um, in North yeah. Devon, broadcasting from North Devon, and um, it's the first time that whole thing played. It was it was being a bit temperamental, but I think I've got a good signal. I think we are good. Good evening, Lucy. Good evening, Tim. Good Seeing. evening. T- oh, have you been Sorry? following Lucy's story of the silver bikini? No, I've I've been a bit I've been a bit off. Oh, good evening, mate, Charlie. Missed it. There's Lucy's the story of the silver bikini. This evening we didn't know before. Um, Apparently she's to parade herself around in a silver bikini, or so I'm told. So she, so she claims. <laughs> um, what today, Lucy's been in a silver bikini? Well, I mean, I learned about it today. I think she was referring to a time when she was 16 years old and knew no better. But uh, what? I mean, I don't know if you did. Maybe you did when you were 16. I don't know. I mean, we all did. When I was 16, we really I people some. Now. A few people have been reading about what I was up to at 16. 16 oh, was the grieving nice. one. 16 was the grieving Jeez. tale. Yes. Well, I mean, and not snogging, which is the, well, not, the not, underlying not theme to the 15, entire book. Not snogging it? at 17. Um, just generally not snogging. Good evening, Zephyr to Jut. Um, um, and how my lover? How you my lover, Charlie? I speak down in Devon. So there we go. Mm-hmm. Um, now, um, Ed, normally we yes. have a bit of a chat at the beginning, don't we, about how you are. But we yes. spent rather a long time in each other's company yesterday evening and, and this morning and Do it's very strange each other off yeah uh yeah. yeah we had a we had a lovely night on the town on the lash with at creative hig our friend uh, yes rachel and, higginson uh, creative hig first time i met her she's we, wonderful yes. she's she's true she's gonna be lash. listening back we were, sure. we were lads on the loose weren't we lads on the loose <laughs> in uh in exeter with Exeter, my with my uh, son along for the ride as well, obviously, you know because he's a lad. Well, on the big loose fan of Douglas. Big fan of Douglas. He 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 for a fifteen year old boy, um, mm. he joins for a in. Fifteen year old boy, with... well, he knows a lot about low traffic neighbourhoods, doesn't he? He <laughs> does need low, low traffic networks or neighbourhoods, and he also knows he knows a lot about a lot, and he he also <laughs> sort of joins in with adultness very well, somewhat better than my my fifteen year old. No, well, I was just when I was getting 16, frustrated I that I didn't snog Joe lot Chamberlain. About, um, Fairport Convention, but I'm not about not lost about much else. I think. Yeah, I was. I was. Yes, when I was 15, I quite. I knew I was starting to know quite a lot about the Cure. Starting to know quite really? a lot about um, early Led Zeppelin. Um, I was knowing yes. very little about how to actually stop talking and have a cheeky snog. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> there we go. Some things never <laughs> change. There was I. <laughs> <laughs> all night I was there waiting for my moment, and all he would do is carry on talking. No snogs allowed. No, broken hearted I was. Yeah. So uh, yeah. you you have you chatted to? So you you sent a tweet. We both sent a few tweets last night and this morning about our um well, this morning mainly about about our night last night. And I was I was a little active on the Twitter this morning about a few things. We might come to that in a moment. But you sent a tweet this afternoon about a conversation with a proper farmer. An authentic no, farmer chat about the signage. No, you know, because you were at my house this morning, the, the, the road outside my house, which is the main road, I say main, from uh, Crediton to, uh, to to Tiverton, not that main yeah. really, but it has been wall-to-wall tractors today. It's been... Yeah. So I think today well, is the day of the, for the cutting of the signage. Uh, it's just the... everywhere. I had to go into Exeter later. And that was uh, choked with with tractors pulling great big trucks for the silage. It was 
Today must today. be the day. I mean, you know, I don't know whether they have a WhatsApp group, all the farmers, and they get together and they say, today's the day. Let's completely mess up all the traffic in Devon. Let's see if we yeah. can just drive around with our tractors all day. Or is it like, um, you know, like the day that the uh, ants all go their wings and fly off? You know, maybe oh, yes. there isn't a WhatsApp group. Maybe just they wake up and today's the day. Off they go with their tractors and their trailers, carting huge amounts of grass around the countryside, confusing <laughs> and annoying everybody who's trying to just drive into Exeter to buy their son a phone because he's dropped it. Oh, oh dear. Did, um, but I, I think I, I was confused because I'm, I'm obviously a bit of a tractor spotter. I, I, I mentioned that to Noreen and... Uh, I love I love my agricultural pornography, um, not in the same way as Matey, the Conservative MP, did. But um, anyway, we won't go there. Um, uh, but so I, the I do MP like for your end, or is he not? He was he was MP, wasn't he? Um, Tiverton, wasn't he MP for Tiverton? It's Tiverton, yeah. Does that cover? Um, no, cover no, Tiverton. Is... No, 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 no. We're West Are you Torridge in and West Devon. Land? In in my yeah. mother's constituency is Torridge and West Devon, um, and um, which generally rotates between Conservatives and Liberal Democrats depending on the mood of the nation. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, but there was a lot of tractors and trailers, and I was confused because there were I when I drove to you yesterday um, from from Tiverton, I followed quite a few, or I followed a few, and then there were lots coming past you from a farm somewhere between Crediton and Tiverton. Um, mm -hmm. And then today, driving from Crediton to Mortchard Road, which is between um, on, on the Barnstable Road, between beyond Cobbleston, mm -hmm. um, and they were going a long way. There were a lot of tractors, and they kept driving through Crediton High Street this morning when we were there. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was confused. I think there must have been a long journey. So this happens now. I know quite a lot about farming and dairy farming. Dairy herds have got a lot bigger. Often mm -hmm. um, farmers will have blocks of land, you know, several miles away from yes. their, their their herd. And, right, and yeah. you know, they've got to bring the grass a long way. But it struck me as rather inefficient. And with all the fuel costs at the moment, and mm. the fact they can't use red diesel in their track as if they're driving on the road, I don't think. Um, oh. or, do, or can they? They might be able to use red diesel. Red diesel, is, of course, has much, much lower tax. I think they probably can use red diesel if it's for agricultural purposes. But still, mm -hmm. red diesel is expensive in comparison to how it used to be. Anyway, so I was just pondering that there must have felt like a sort of 10-mile journey from farm to field, which is incredibly inefficient. Anyway, let's not talk about farming anymore. Sure, we are. Um, are we done farming? Are we done? Are we well, exhausted that topic? I mean, I could talk about it for hours, but I, I don't okay. know whether it's a... I mean... You know, anyone I think want I to... could talk about it for hours, but you'd have to accept that everything I said was, you know, at best fictional and at <laughs> worst ignorant, I think. But uh, <laughs> we can move on and talk about yeah. something else I'm ignorant on, if you like. Well, we were our, our topic, our topic, um, steam fares for the wind from Charlie. Yeah, I do like Mortra Bishop Way. Exactly, Lucy. Mm -hmm. Very good. Where you did very, very good. I like this interact a little bit. Um, hi, everyone. I just joined up. What's the subject of the show? Noman asks impatiently. Well, what is the subject of the show? Good point. Uh, um, <laughs> cut to the main chase. subject. Our, our <laughs> subject for discussion, loosely linked to teaching, um, strongly yes. linked to teaching, actually, is um, mm -hmm. the chemistry of a cohort. The, the chemistry, chemistry of a cohort. Of a cohort. So, so how that... And, and perhaps, oh, you know... One could argue in the primary classroom, it may be a slightly bigger and more important deal than in a secondary classroom. But I I, I'm, well, let's get to that. Let's get to that. But the chemistry yeah, of cohort, how... I don't think I would say that, but, you know, carry on, make your point, uh, and I'll take it. No, down. so I, I think I think we want to talk about the chemistry of a cohort, not how... how mm. I mean, I've taught sort of eight for eight years now. And I teach year five through to year eight. And so I, and I often teach them in each of those years, science, that is. And so um, you see them change quite a lot from being, mm -hmm. you don't see the characters change. The characters stay exactly the same. Um, but their, their, um, their adolescence of adolescence changes a lot and their impressionability changes a lot from the beginning of year five to the end of year eight. Um, and, and so, and and I've, I've there have been real real variety to a few maths classes, quite slightly smaller maths classes as well, and how how the the chemistry, the the interactions or lack of interactions or the lack of balance mm. um, can affect 
the I suppose the learning performance, the active learning performance, not necessarily the long term achievement, but um, but the, the, the what it feels like to teach that class and, and how enjoyable it is and how enjoyable it is for the children in the in that class. So mm-hmm. uh, we we thought we'd have a bit of a discussion about that, really, but also that could apply to a staff room as well or a yeah, yeah. meeting or a work group or, you know, when I suddenly worked in industry, it was a big deal. So so I, I rather I'll grab it on about it a little bit more. But what what do you have? that you'd like to sort of say about that and your experience of it? Because, Eddie, you've taught a lot of classes. I've taught a lot of classes, and I've taught a lot of classes in quite a lot of sort of different situations, you know, from mm. from teaching, you know, very small groups of adults, teaching English as a foreign language and teaching very huge, huge classes. I had 106 in a class when I was teaching in Ethiopia, you know. And you'd have thought wow. when you got classes as big as that, you know, when you got classes where... 100 is you know around the mark somewhere between 80 and 100 was my average in those classes you'd have thought that maybe that would be a big enough statistical set that it would kind of i don't know even out you know and go oh, okay but but not at all i found each class had a very distinct uh feeling to it and, uh, and those kids stayed in the class all day you know that was the model that they used in the high schools in ethiopia it was the you know, hundred yeah. kids you don't want them trying to move around do you You're several thousand children moving around a campus don't do that keep them in one place and, and move the um, adults around clearly much more sensible um, yes i think that's quite a good model sensible, sometimes but it means that those kids have got a really strong imprinted you know this is our space that you step into you know yeah because they're there for six lessons on the trot and I, I step in and do my lesson and step out and summer, you know, so I used to high five the next teacher coming in, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, those were big classes and they, you know, each class had a very definite flavour, some of which were very welcoming and warm and some of which were, you know, less so. And I just think that's the same everywhere I've taught, whether it was, you know, small groups of adults in Poland or whether it was, you know, 30 children in a classroom in the UK. I think that groups of people very quickly um do form you know a sense of themselves as a group and a sense of how they are to others as they come in and go and so forth you know and i think it's a very small number of people in the group who actually set the flavor that's what i think i think there's normally about you know in any class there's just a very small number of people who actually inform the others i think of them as the bellwethers if that's a term that makes any sense you know (laughs) what do you go and explain do you not what know you what a bell weather is? So you know, well, I mean, so uh, you want to know where the where a group of um, sheep are going. You can put a you don't need to put a bell on every sheep because you know they're going to stay together, right? Yeah. So you put a bell on one of them, and that bell will tell you where they all are because they'll all be together. You know. Yes. So if you've got an eye in a group of kids, you go. This is this is the one who's uh, this is the one who's making the weather. Keep an eye. Different use of the word weather there. Um, uh, yeah, this is the kid who who needs to be on board, or this is the kid who's who's setting the atmosphere. Um, yeah, you know. So yeah, I think about you know, I think of those those Ethiopian classes. And have you had class. have you had you know? I know which. What's the year group in a in a in an English primary school that you've taught most? Six, five, younger, younger. Kind of all of them, really. Uh, do you know what? I've moved across. I started off in six. Well, five, six, because the school was smaller then. Yeah. They would, uh, I did three, four for a bit. I've taught, I've taught all those groups because I did uh, PPA across the school for a long time, and then I've okay. taught bits of secondary, and I've taught adults as well. I don't think it's, I don't, you know, the hardest class I had to teach in terms of, you know, it may, you know, it just being solidly hard work was a year three class. Uh, Ooh, yeah. And that was because of the, you know, the particular needs of some of the individuals in the class, which mm. were, you know, social or, you know, social, emotional, mental health issues. Uh, and there was a number of children in the class who, who you know, as a result of their, their, their emotional needs were very demanding. But that meant the whole class then had that whole feeble atmosphere. You know, some people are very demanding of your uh, attention, which means the rest of the class has to be demanding your attention to get it. It was exhausting, you know. And yeah. another three and classes I've had have been absolute dreams, you know. I don't think it's about the uh, age of the children. I've had I've taught year ones where you could have a ball and actually, you know, it was a great deal of fun. I've had year ones where it was just pushing a boulder uphill all day. At the end of the day, if you've done enough of it, you learn, don't you, that 
okay, well, this is hard, and it'll be hard through to the end of July, and then hopefully it'll be different in September. Well, yeah. I think that's... I think if you get a really hard class when you're early in your career, you think, oh, my God, is it me? Am I the worst yeah. teacher in the world? Uh, but once you've done it, as long as, uh, you know, as long as... No, I have, it's makes me interesting, sound like isn't it? And I, think I, have, I, think. I definitely feel, feel that... Um, Oh gosh, lost my train of thought. But yes, no, that's right. Not the age of the children, more the cohort. Uh, I would mm. totally concur because if you have a a quite a you know bouncy, but in, in a good way, an energetic, a curious, mm. you know, perhaps a little sort of cheeky and edgy, but but not you know not 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 rude or nonchalant. Actually, quite hard working, but just a fizzy yeah. class, a fizzy class, but with with a sort of a little bit of an energy for learning, then. Um, I that I, I like that. I, I like that. That's my yeah, style. I, I perhaps generate that. And you what know. you said there was about the curiosity is the bit, isn't it? If you've got a group of children yeah. who are curious and they and you say here's something that's interesting, they'll come to you and go, Oh, tell us about it. Um, yeah. more than anything else, they don't have to be well behaved or whatever. I mean, really, I don't mind too much about that. If they've got curiosity, then I can work with them. If they haven't got curiosity, then it's like stirring mud it's in a bucket. Pulling teeth, it's... isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and like, I think, was I talking to you about this? I, I was, wasn't I? I can't remember whether Probably. we were talking on air or not. That's very unprofessional. I was saying I've got a class at my school, and I won't identify any more than that because you never know. It's possible someone might listen. But I've got a class at the moment who I think are very dif- difficult because they have no curiosity or seem not mm. to you know i think we touch on this and you go, well what can we do with this because they just you know you go you could show them oh uh, you know a beautiful inlaid box with a silver catch and you could say listen when i slide this catch across with my thumb something wonderful is gonna happen and they would look at you and go yeah whatever you know <laughs> or you could yeah. say this is this rock came out of the guts of an actual volcano can you imagine Nearly 2,000 years ago, and this is a rock which I picked up on the street in Pompeii, you know, and they would look at you and go, yeah, it's just a rock. Yeah, whatever. Where in other <laughs> classes, they might be a little bit cheeky or a bit bouncy, but you'd say about your yeah, beautiful inlaid box with a silver catch, and they'd lean forward and wait. You know, they might be waiting to catch you out, but at least they'd be interested in something. Yeah, and I think we, we um, I, I definitely feel that. I've got one class at, at school this this year who are, are like in one year group actually there's two two classes and um and oh, yeah they're, they're really nice kids and and a few of them are reasonably reasonably sort of you know competent but they're just not really mm. bothered and and there was one i think the worst mm. class the worst year i taught was a few years ago they 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 they're probably i won't say what year group they are now because then come look at what year group they were then um but they were just a very, there were a bunch of children. The boys and the girls didn't really have much connection. So, so you know, they, the boys were very close and tight and the girls were quite close and tight. And there were some nice kids in the group, but they were just a very, not introverted, um, in fact, but they were very inward. They, they, they couldn't, they were kind of like blink. They had their blinkers on. They, 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 they could only mm-hmm. sort of, find what each other found funny or each other found interesting kind of interesting anything outside of their narrow little sort of 9 10 11 12 year old worlds was mm-hmm. was sort of just didn't and it was like that they just didn't get sort of fired up you couldn't you couldn't extract them from themselves which of course is i, I think is the idea of teaching isn't it it's to try and extract yeah. a a person whatever age they may be from the inner workings of their their mind <laughs> and and their their interests to try and persuade them that what you're teaching them is is worthwhile is exciting and or, or useful or, or um and i know that that's quite hard at sometimes in 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 the uh, in the rigorous and rigid curricula that, that we're asked to teach children sometimes but mm. but um it does it, it makes a huge difference and i think i think so i think we've talked about that we both probably quite like a a slightly fizzy enthusiastic class that that yes you're going to have to put a lid on at times and and you know you're going to have to have a firm boundary with but they you can achieve so much more with them than you can with the the other class who perhaps behave a bit better actually but they're just mm-hmm. they're just sort of Oh, you know, it's just like, well, what's this? All, what's the point in all this, really? You know, I've I've got all this stuff I want to talk about with you, 
and you're not remotely bloody interested. And, yeah, you can and come um, towards me just a tiny bit. Yeah. <laughs> come towards me just a tiny bit, and then we'll yeah. find somewhere in the middle, won't we? But if you won't yeah. start step towards me, I kind of wonder if, you know, I mean, and we can't blame everything on it, but I wonder whether there is an impact of, of the lockdown y stuff. Lockdown has definitely affected the, the cohort I'm talking about. Uh, the lock, mm. the current cohort I'm talking about, definitely, uh, they're just a bit behind the curve with the expectations of, of my or whole school expectations of of classroom mm. vibe. Really, I'd say, yeah. um, <laughs> not not classroom behaviour per se or or learning habits. Really, it's more. It's just uh, yeah, they just oh, it's the whole thing about how we socialise children into the behaviors that we want and it's not coercive it's just this is how humans do it you know we we get together in groups and and those groups form a set of expectations or of ways of being i don't know i don't know what to say but but you know and i think for some of those children they missed great chunks which were quite important chunks of like how do we do this thing you know whether it's you know, we sit cross-legged on a carpet and we face this way. And even if we've got something fascinating to say, we kind of have to put our hands up or wait till it's our turn. You know, I've got children who are obviously missing that chip. They didn't have it. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, and so they I'm don't just, get it, you know. Or whether up on it's something... like we had... oh, Carry on, yeah. Sorry, picking up on something Charlie's just written in the chat about, and she taught a girl yeah. in year 12. And, and you're, this is Charlie, year 12, this is teaching physics, um, presumably, mm. um, a level or i think you've taught some astronomy as well i mean gcse astronomy but if it's year 12 that's 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 probably physics a level or maybe chemistry mm -hmm. a level i don't know but um who taught a girl in year 12 this year who'd never really looked at the moon which if you've chosen a sciencey based subject now i know there's some people who are you know botanists and stuff but oh, charlie's replied now um there's some people who are botanists it was gcse astronomy to some year 12s okay so they choose it as an, as an extra gcse option in, in in okay that's cool so um yeah and and they've chosen to do gcse astronomy and yet they've never looked at the moon that's astonishing i find that's the, the sort of but but there are you know I'm, and I'm not knocking that human because they may have been very busy worrying about where their next meal was coming from or something potentially but mm -hmm. but um mm -hmm. but still it's it is i mean we can't the world would be exhausting though if everyone was as intellectually curious as as i am you know if everyone was <laughs> bloody like me i mean i would be you know and that that's the other point i think about the cohort that i wanted to talk about so so we've talked about a a fizzy enthusiastic cohort that you can work with and achieve feel like you're achieving quite a lot with and then we talked about the sort of sedate nonchalant cohort but but i think what I wanted to perhaps move on to, and then we can talk about this primary versus secondary as well in a moment, is more an imbalanced cohort, or as you alluded to earlier on, Ed, a cohort mm. that's con subliminally or, or explicitly controlled by one or two individuals. Um, and, and, and I'm not necessarily talking about in the classroom. Um, it's more about around the school and the behaviour of the school in the, in the school. So, so we obviously I teach in a, in a independent school. So our class sizes are smaller, um, and we go up to the end of year eight um, rather than finishing at the end of year six. And and um, it's interesting that, that you know you just have a cohort that that are happy most of the time in and out of the classroom, and you you know generally. There's, there are different groups of children, but they somehow work together, you know, so there's some more extrovert, sporty types. There's some who think they're a little bit cooler than they really are. There's some who are just not worried about the being cool thing and are perhaps a little bit more introverted or a little bit more nerdy or a little bit more quirky. And and but somehow all those different factions all sort of come together in balance when they have to but sometimes and i've had one where you have a, a person who's you know i suppose I, a little bit damaged really you know he's complicated mm -hmm. a complicated child who who has got you know uh, unassigned some unassigned mental health complexity or or mm -hmm. or you know a little bit you know you know just just that, 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 that you know maybe they have do do a bit of bullying, you know, but so, but not 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 obvious bullying, and they're just a bit sort of controlling, and and so people, other people in the year, 
then are fearful of them and behave differently or in, in a small school. Now, this is a problem challenge we have because we're a school that prides itself on on, you know, the teachers and the children all know each other really well. And we know the kind of parents pretty well. And it's a very friendly, pastorally kind of rich sort of place. Um, but of course, if you do have a very strong character who's a little bit messy and a little bit complicated, there's there's nowhere to sort of divide and conquer, you know, really. Yeah. And and it's tricky. And and um, and that that can have a really big knock on effect on the whole you know, and it can be an, it, then it can be a whole exhausting teaching year, if or, or, or teaching three years if you yeah. if you're teaching and it can through go the, the other way, can't it? I mean, I remember yeah. a class which um, could had some really challenging characters in, and could have been a very difficult class, but it had these two lads in. I won't use their names. They're both they're actually twin brothers, and I know their mum reasonably well um, now. I didn't then, um, and these two lads were just immensely positive and immensely engaged and quite charismatic and very well liked in in the class and as a result the whole class would kind of look to them for the reactions in this really sweet way so you knew if these two lads were on board then you were okay yeah everybody else even these kids who were quite troubled and quite difficult and like had the you know had the capacity to make your life a tricky one you know, and I, I mean, I always thought that that was true from when I started teaching that class in year, I think I first taught them when they were in year three, and I taught them right through to the end of year, year six, and it remained true right through that um, that those two boys set the weather in that class. Yeah, and yeah. And difficult, challenging children who uh, might otherwise have been having a horrible time of education, actually, to be honest, one way or another. Were able, mm. they were just able to handle it because because of the positivity they got from these two lads. Sweet, um, isn't it? Sweet, isn't it? Picking up on Lucy in the chat. Um, mm. uh, Lucy, you're a year six teacher, I think, and you obviously have more than one class in your in each year. You're more than one form entry, so that you mix the, the cohorts in each class. You mix the you balance every year, which is something we do because we have two classes each year group, and so we change the things, forms around. But of course, they come together quite a lot in 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 you know certain times of the day. But but also, I think. I think in a class, yeah. So, so how many class year groups? Ugh, how many classes per year have you got, Lucy? Answer on the chat, please. Um, but yes, it does seem to help when you mix things up a bit each year. And I guess in secondary. So let's talk about secondary for a little bit because I think, I think some of our conversations were a little primary-ish centric there, although mm -hmm. two, but shrinking to one. Okay, okay, ooh, okay. Um, so. In secondary, and Charlie's in online, and I think maybe a couple of other people are secondary teachers. Tim, I think, is a secondary teacher as well. Mm -hmm. um, it, it depends on, you know, I think in, in my, you know, if we go down right down to the extreme Michaela end of the spectrum, where the classroom environment is, as far as I can tell, uh, very tightly controlled so that the character of the children may be drawn out in the in the sort of whiteboard discussion dialectic elements of the lesson but it seems to me that in the in the most extreme elements of of sort of knowledge rich direct instruction silent corridored land the sort of richness and diversity of character in the classroom is perhaps sort of slightly blanded out so i can't imagine cohorts varying so much but that's maybe my naivety and misinterpretation of some of the cultures that in 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 these schools i know charlie is quite a traditionalist quite a cog sci sci kind of person so have you got a kind of comment about that um in terms of the the sort of you know how how important how varied is is a cohort in 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 you know in a year ten chemistry class from year to year, if it's if it's second set or top set or lower set, whatever, is it approximately the same kind of vibe or does it really really vary? I know Richard Newbold said something about that in on Twitter last week. He said no, his current year twelve chemistry A level students, um, you know, are some are just you know some are much more fit that fizz the stuff we were talking about. It matters. I think at A level probably matters in the same way we're talking about primary. You know, you can have a more curious or just a slightly more dynamic group or, or you can have a very quiet and introverted and, and cautious and safe group. But um, 
But there we go. What's Charlie saying? Secondary age kids definitely have differed without the mixing with other years because of the bubbling effect. OK, so that's that's been an effect. Students don't have those hierarchical experiences that allow us to understand how to behave in a group. Oh, OK. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely have different. Yeah. OK. So I think I think. Um, yeah, that's that's. But I, so I suppose if we want children to learn, I, I kind of think that you do need to learn by. By being a bit dialogic, don't you? And be, being bouncing ideas around. And, and if there's a very introverted and introverted people kind of I, I'm obviously extremely extroverted, but introverted people do sort of run the world quietly. You know, there's a lot mm -hmm. of people who make a lot of noise on the surface. But, you know, it's the quiet people in the back room. It's the civil servants, isn't it, who kind of run, you know, and I'm not all civil servants are introverted. I, I don't know that. But, but, you know, they're not It's the sort of front of house people are not necessarily the people who are actually making the key decisions in, in an organization. Um, so, and I think, I think that's one of the slightly frustrating things about teaching, isn't it? Is that we, we're sometimes drawn when we're report writing about the, you know, they're not very, they don't really contribute. They don't put their hand up very often, but they might be just quietly Einsteining everything, might they? They're just they might quietly be, thinking they about might it. Be, uh, they might and, be influencing the class, you know, what we're talking about is. Uh, just by being quiet and calm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, modelling what that looks like, that's influential, isn't it? I mean, and that's important. We can't do without them, really. Yeah. We can't do without them. You no. Um, yes, and so... the idea that being a person who's always got their hand up and always got something to say is is, is helpful. Or, well, it's not really, is it? You know, actually. It's not helpful if it's, you know, there's one person I've taught last, uh, recently, and, and um incredibly curious really curious but also really impatient and if you're impatient and curious in a classroom situation that that's just selfish right it's just it's just mm -hmm. you know you've got to learn to be patient and wait your turn it's not all about you there's 29 others or even 14 others or something in the class and your curiosity is not what this lesson's all about you know but you know let's deploy your curiosity more or evenly. Um, anyway, Ed, I'd quite like to do the news and then maybe spend yeah. five minutes talking about um, chemistry in staff room or in work groups and, and some of the stuff yeah. that I did at Zeneca and Pfizer in terms of generating you know, a positive and, and, and dynamic working environment in meetings and things like that. I'd quite like to spend five six seven eight minutes talking about that and 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 some of the cynicism that the teaching profession perhaps has about some of the things that are done in team building in classes and in in work groups and teams and things mm. like that which would be quite interesting to talk about i think and then just before the end of the show we might just go back to 1952 for a few minutes and think <laughs> about what the classroom would have been like 70 years ago if the Queen had gone to school, which of course she didn't, um, she had a governess, but, um, and if she went to the local primary or if she went to the local posh prep school, what would it have been like in 1952 in comparison to now? And um, we'll just ponder on that for a bit and then we'll have a little bit of ukulele to end the show. So okay. let's do the news. It's a long one, I think, tonight, people. It's, um, we've got some adverts. We've got some news. We'll have a highly informative tech update with the information comes at you too fast to be able to do anything with it. <laughs> um, um, whoops. Um, anyway, here you go, people. Eight minutes, 20 seconds. Um, listen attentively or go and make a cup of tea or get another glass of wine, etc. We'll be back in eight minutes. bye -zy bye This episode of Teachers Talk Radio has been made possible with support from Witherslack Group, the UK's leading provider of SEN education and care. They're here to support you too through an ever-growing offer of free resources, including webinars, podcasts, articles and events aimed at supporting teaching professionals like you. Visit their website at www.weatherslackgroup.co.uk to find out more. Imagine a world where you were free to focus on sparking curiosity in your students and giving them access to the awe and wonder of learning. A world where you were supported to deliver a truly personalised education to help all your learners achieve their potential. 
no need to imagine it, because that's exactly what the Oxford Smart Curriculum Service delivers. Seamlessly integrating curriculum, resources, assessment, next steps and professional development, every component of Oxford Smart is connected and working to provide you with a uniquely coherent and responsive service that empowers you and your students with transformational effect. The Oxford Smart Curriculum Service. When everything connects, anything is possible. Stevewoods.co.uk for educational support in IT and computer science. Coming up, I'm delivering a number of courses. Learn to program in Python is a free one-hour course designed to start you on your way into Python coding. Everything works in a browser, so there's nothing to install beforehand. Join me remotely to learn the basics on Wednesday the 8th of June, 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock. Visit stevewoods.co.uk to start your journey. Are you a state school teacher in England? Why not be a hero this half term and join me for two days and receive up to 1,360 £60 in bursary. Terms and conditions apply. Find out more at stevewoods.co.uk. If you're listening to this, then we know we share one thing in common. A passion for the type of outstanding education that every child deserves. That's what makes us the leading provider of specialist education and care. We need people like you to help us achieve even more. With us, you'll be given all the resources and support you need, offered a clear path to career progression, and be rewarded with some of the best salaries and benefits the industry has to offer. We are with a Slack group. If you'd like to find out more, we'd love to hear from you. Visit www.withaslackgroup.co.uk forward slash careers and be part of our future. This is Teachers Talk Radio and this is Teachers Talk Radio News with Gail Glenn. Chancellor and Richmond MP Rishi Sunak is set to pay £63,000 in private school fees for his two daughters next year. The senior boarding school his daughter will attend in September is to see fees increase to £41,250, taking the household education bill to £63,000. Last month, Mr Sunak, who is a millionaire, donated £100,000 to his former boarding school, Winchester College. The money funds bursaries for children whose parents would otherwise not be able to afford to send them to the school, where Mr Sunak was head boy. Winchester College charges £43,335 per year. In Scotland, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon is facing pressure to fund universal free school meals for secondary school pupils, as the Bank of England warns that supermarket bills and other household costs will continue to rocket until the end of the year. This will drive thousands of parents and carers below the poverty line. Leslie Davidson, who runs a Loaves and Fishes food bank, has seen unprecedented demand from parents, terrified of having to send children to school on an empty stomach. She said, Providing a meal for all primary and secondary children at school is a no-brainer. It is the most fundamental responsibility of government to make sure children are not going hungry. Scottish Labour MSP Monica Lennon said, No child should be going hungry in a country as rich as ours. Expanding access to universal free school meals will reduce child poverty and stop hunger holding back the next generation. With the cost of living crisis hitting families hard, I am proud to have taken the argument for expanding universal free school meals to the Scottish Parliament because our ambitions for children and young people should not stop at the primary school gates. This has been your latest Teachers Talk Radio News with Gail Glenn. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, 
over this week I'm going to talk about spreadsheet modelling. Spreadsheets are marmite. You either love them or you hate them. This week I hope to help you see a reason to include them in your next lesson or even to spice up a form time. What is technology? It's anything that helps us in life. For example, scissors, cutlery, even a paper straw. Let's take a look at the good old paper straw. Build as an environmental hero. It's time for the spreadsheet to model some facts about paper straws. Before I begin, I totally get the paper straws are better for the environment than plastic. This episode's about looking deeper into topics at pace, using the all-powerful spreadsheet to provide high speed and sometimes complex calculations. With a trusty search engine by my side, here I go into what is the true cost of a paper straw. Okay, the first answer to produce a paper straw costs a penny. Now how about how many paper straws are used in a year? The US use 5 million per day. Europe, a mere 7 million per day. How many trees is that? Right, a typical straw weighs 1.1 grams. So times 7 million is 7,700,000 grams divided by 1,000 is 7,700 kilograms divided by 1,000 again is 7.7 .7 tons. Back to the search engine, it takes 24 trees to make one ton of paper. So so 185 trees rounded to the nearest tree. It takes eight trees to provide enough oxygen for one person for a year. So each day we kill enough trees to keep 23 people alive for a year for the sake of a paper straw. Let's take a quick step back. 185 trees per day times 365 days is 67,452 trees per year. That can keep 8,431 people alive. In a densely packed forest, that's around one kilometre square of trees. It takes, on average, 15 years for a tree to grow to be used for paper. People of Europe are spending 27,830,000 per year on paper straws. That's £76,246 a day. If you listen to this on Friday, since Monday, 925 trees have been used for a one-use purpose. Now, with the power of the mighty spreadsheet and a few questions, I'll be leaving that straw behind and drinking from the cup. Do you want to add to my argument or even challenge it? Want to get in touch on the TT Radio 2022 Twitter feed? Follow us and tell us what you want to know about tech. I'm Steve Woods, and that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods. Your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Oh, back in the room, back in the room, back in the room. Are you there? Everyone, hello, welcome. I'm Ed, here. are you with us? Oh, I'm here. Right. I'm here. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa survived good <laughs> okay so before we talk about outsider teaching um mm -hmm. charlie's comment about um all those hormones in mm -hmm. in adolescent children you know in the bubble bubbled post covid bubbled or during covid bubbled world all those humans have no real, real experience around other teenagers outside of their primary school mates um you know not not just not mingling enough, not being socialized enough. But, you know, I, I kind of, even though you do have a lot of schools do kind of vertical tutor groups and there will be some age mingling in things like drama productions and perhaps mm. in, in sort of, you know, the more creative or sporty kind of aspects of the day um, and, and, you know, not as bubbled, you know, not in, in smaller groups, but, but, you know, largely speaking through through education um we're in our year group aren't we we're in our year group and yes someone might be really the oldest in the year and someone might be youngest of the year and and that people talk about that being a massive issue it is probably a massive issue when you're under seven um i'm not sure it's a massive issue when you're 11 or, or 15 but some argue that it can carry all the way through um uh but yeah i i think that's i do think that's something that in my utopia Edutopia. I would not have children just mixing with their year group um, all day. I think. I think when children are very young, you you can't be socialising four year olds if we choose to start at school at that age, which is a whole other debate. Um, with with probably eight year olds or or, or eight year olds with twelve year olds routinely. But but I do think, you know, there should probably be a two or three year range. And a lot of small, you must have a lot of small schools in your trust, Ed, uh, the, the, you yeah. know, the, not your trust, but the trust that you are part of. Um, you've, also, you've got 16 primaries, haven't you, I think, in rural Devon primaries? Yes, uh, 14, 14 primaries plus two that we're with in a sort of a management relationship with. But yeah. yes, and, and a lot of those schools, the majority of those schools are, we'll have to... are, are very small indeed. So you you can't have year, single year groups. 
you know, right. there's a number of them where you'll have children in year R1 and 2 in one class, and then next door you'll have the 3, 4, 5, and 6. Yeah. And and they have to work out a way of, you know, being together. And it and I think people who like that often think it's very healthy, you know, and it always gives the school a real family feel and things. Yeah. And so, you know, and you know, you can take that with a pinch of salt to an extent, can't you? And you can say, well, yeah, I don't know, that's 100%. Um, effective for everybody in the room. But well, no, I think it can be difficult in in the in the way education is designed, which is very year group. Relation, yeah, in terms of relationships and learning to get on with other people, and you know, there's lots lots of aspects of it which are good. I think, and you can teacher, have it's a flipping nightmare. <laughs> it's a nightmare in, in, the, in our in our system. It's a nightmare in our system. I get that, but mm. but in 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 overarching sort of principle, you can have a really sort of sparky, curious year four child and a really not so sparky yeah, and not so curious year six child. 100%. And and so I mean, and I was likewise used to the first that part happens of my career, in... I was teaching mixed year groups and for a hundred percent you go, listen, you know, I've got a year five and six and the lowest attaining child is one of the year sixes and the highest attaining child of children is one of the year fives and uh, and we have to make it work, you know? Yeah, and I have to, you know, and, and, and then you just think about adolescence as well. In, in, and, you know, we know that it starts really early for some people um, and it can start really late for others, you know. And, and I know mm. I have two daughters. I won't say which is which, but, but you know, they had their first period two and a half years apart, you know, uh, 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 to, uh, with their own age. Sorry. So one of them, mm-hmm. you know, really early year six and the other one, um, you know, into into sort of beginning of year nine or, or late, very late year eight. Yeah. You know, and and um and and that you know, obviously that's not linked to cognition, but it it is linked to approach and attitude and mood and 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 maturity mm. and and all that sort of stuff. So it can be, and and so I, I think that's one of the challenges. So um, but just thinking about that and age, of course after school and university um although there will always be a few mature students at university but proportionally that's a relatively low number um we are you know are not really you know unless you go and work for some huge corporation which has a huge graduate recruitment scheme you we we, you know once you hit 21 or 22 you're going to be working with people who are 32 or 42 or 52 and and um and uh that becomes you know, that's quite a shock, isn't it? Sometimes, I suppose, when you've been used to just hanging out with people who've, and, and I notice it when if you have a new intake at school of younger mm. teachers, and then there's those of us in our kind of late forties or early fifties who've, who've, you know, who've got almost grown up kids, you know, that aren't much younger than their them themselves, mm. and you, you just see the world differently. And so, you know, you might be doing a very similar job, and and um. But but you sort of have a very different perspective on on life by the time you get to fifty to when, you, right. when you're twenty five. You've gone through school in your age group, and then gone through your BAQTS or whatever it is you did in your age group. And this could be your starting in this school where you're going to be working. Could be the first time you're supposed to be having on the level conversations of equality with people who are thirty years older than you. Yeah, except for your parents, exactly. And I mean, I'm I've I've never you, you've got lots of siblings, and I've got lots of mm. much older half siblings, and and my dad was twenty four years older than my mum. So age and generation gaps have never been an issue for me. I've always I've, I've always been quite attracted to. I don't mean that physically necessarily. Um, <laughs> attracted to people who are a bit older and a bit more who've been there and seen it and have got a little bit more wisdom um, about things. And and I think whereas there are some people you know, who are, as you say, who just exist in that, in their age band and in their families and in their, in their schools. And that, that's, that, that takes a few years to break that down sometimes in, 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 the, in their working lives. Um, but at Pfizer, no, at Zeneca, let's go back to when I was at Zeneca, we did a thing in teams, you know, in our like work groups, I can't remember what it was called, but we did a thing where I was, a, I found out I was a plant you had different people, had, you know, you do a survey. It's a bit like the sort of de Bono's, not de Bono's thinking hats, but it's a bit like, you know, are you a sort of, a bit like a bit like Myers-Briggs sort of stuff, you know, are you, are you an extrovert, yeah. intuitive, you know, what's it, extrovert, introvert, intuitive, sensing, oh, thinking, feeling, 
and then judging, perceiving. And, you know, you, we can debunk these things, but there's something in them. There's something in these things that there are, you know, if you are have a certain profile, character profile, um, then you are going to behave in a certain way and you're going to bring a certain set of behaviours and energy or lack of energy or, or lack of patience or patience to a work situation and 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 i think we did something and i you know i found out a plant which is like a creative ideas person i like to kind of come up with ideas but i'm not i'm not an implementer so imp, you know and if but, but what can happen in the world of work um is we tend to recruit people based on their their job specific skills or their job specific knowledge and not Therefore, you can end up assembling, you can have a whole team of very introverted, um, non-creative thinkers, or you can have a team of really bloody extrovert, off-the-scale creative thinkers, and then you just get this horrible balance. And I remember working in a, in a group at Pfizer where I was the only gregarious, outgoing, verbose person person in the in the village um and and everyone else was just a really in, in one particular group not all the time at Pfizer there were some gregarious people there but there was one group I worked in it's a controlled release technology group and everyone was just so cautious and so meticulous and and of course that's quite a common trait in in scientists but it was just it just felt like pulling paint for me and you know watching paint dry sorry and and uh, pulling teeth and others they must have been exhausted but infuriated by me. Whereas, you know, if you are, I know what happens in industry at a high level is that, you know, if you're constructing a project team to, to do something, then you will look as much at the skill balance. You'll look at the, the, um, the character balance so that you haven't got a room full of creative thinkers, but no implementers or completer finishers or whatever they're called, you know, and, and you try and get that balance. And, and obviously we don't have that freedom in a class because you've got the 30 kids that you, if you've got a one form entry primary school or, or, you know, whatever, eight, seven or eight classes per year in a secondary, you've got the cohort you've got, you've got the, the ability or the cat score that you've got. And, and, and that character can be you you know you can end up with a really really and it's the same sort of thing but i think i think it's quite interesting and i know that talking to rachel last night creative creative hig mm. um at creative hig she was talking about how when she was primary teacher how how she's invested quite a lot of time early on in in creating that um kind of um that kind of chemistry of a cohort and, and understanding people's different characters and spending a bit of time on that and that's that whole character education thing and isn't it about about working about how we think and feel and you know where we are on the sort of scale of independence and scale of collaboration sort of tendencies and things and I think I think that that is worth doing in a September it's worth spending a bit of time on 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 that you know obviously if you see mm. the class for one hour a week for 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 whatever it is you know PE or something then you probably don't need to spend too much time doing that but if you've got them six hours a day in a primary class or, or three hours a week four hours a week in an English or maths class then it might be worth thinking about that how they're gonna how are we going to work together how are we going to get the best out of each other how are we all going to learn together um any thoughts on that Ed I agree <laughs> I don't think we do it I mean I don't think we do it a lot I think and uh, you're quite right that multinationals are thinking this is quite a serious bit of making sure that the mach the learning machine and the working machine does its job and we probably aren't doing much of that and um you don't I get mean, to make any choices you know but you can no. say hang on a sec so who is it that we have here in this room and how are we going to make it work i agree um and it is so, it know. is it, it sounds fluffy and it is, it's infuriating you know you get you get you go on a sort of training course you do your Myers-Briggs or you or you have a bit of really dynamic CPD and you it's it's, it's easy to dismiss this stuff because it is being a bit sort of hippie but but you know as you say in a multinational which is yeah, you know breadhead, profit very driven breadheaded people are doing it aren't they <laughs> yeah you know, yeah breadheaded people indeed are finding it a useful thing to do so uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe it is um, I'm just looking, picking up some comments on the chat. Our tutor groups are all single sex due to the boarding house system. 
Um, this is in Tiverton, isn't it, Tim? I think I think Tiverton. I think Tim teaches at Blundells in Tiverton. I think. Um, I don't know if I've outed you. Sorry if I have. Um, but going to mixed for sixth form next year, along with more opportunities for mixing of other year groups. Yeah, I think I think that's it. You know, in the real world. You know, I, this is why I'm not that into single sex education. That's why in Kent, you know, you've got the single sex grammar system. You know, the world is mixed, when, you know, and and I think I think we need and, and it's mixed age and it's not just mixed gender, it's mixed everything. And I think we need to develop that all the way through, but not necessarily at all times force it. So if you've got a bunch of five intellectually curious GCSE astronomers, get them out get them all together don't don't force them to be you know with with the uh, gcse botanists at the same time sort of thing i know that's not the best example but you know um have we done this this chemistry of cohorts and the the energy or the lack of energy have we done this topic any justice people i think i think it's been a nice thing to talk about not perhaps one of our most controversial or abstract um discussions but i think I think it's been nice to talk about that. I've enjoyed yeah. that. Um, yeah, I'm, you know, I think that I think the people in Radio Land have been very patient indeed, hasn't it? it hasn't been the, the biggest laugh of our. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Topic, is it? Um, anyway, anyway, we're, anyway. I'm not very half turned. I've enjoyed suppose. that one. How long have we got? We have got four minutes. Four minutes. <laughs> what are we doing next? <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I spoke, we spoke about the jubilee last week. I've got my mm. pipe in my in my hand, and I'm just. Just going back to 1952, um, yeah. in a West Country accent, you know, but how different was it? How different was it, the classroom in 1952? Well, maybe it wasn't that different, is my main feeling on this. It, the demands of the, uh, of the curriculum were very different, I think. Yes. I think that's true. And I think that, that you know, that's a challenge for us. But, in um, in a um, I don't know if in all schools, but certainly in the pr in the private school system, there would have been a very large and significant deterrent, often mishandled. Mm -hmm. So that was a very different. You know, you, there would have been the corporal punishment would have been rife, um, and 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 that would have meant that that I don't I, you know what children are going to step out of line are going to step out of line. I don't think it makes any difference, yeah. I don't think it makes I mean, much of a difference. If you look in the record book of uh, you know the, any school of any age, they'll have a, re a log book in a, in a cupboard somewhere which will tell you, you know, who got thrashed. Yeah. And lots of people were getting thrashed and lots of them were getting thrashed a lot. And, and being very damaged by it, some of them, but some yeah, of them were just were. indifferent to it, completely indifferent to it, just like they're indifferent to detention now, exactly. probably. So, I mean, yeah. I think that uh, actually it doesn't it, it doesn't seem to work that good. No. As a, well, we as don't a, know. We, we're not, I'm not proposing we go back to 1952 no, in terms of court. But I don't think the idea that it's a deterrent and that, you know, kids would have been better behaved. We can see they weren't because we can see the record of punishment. But, you know, I'm sure some people will... will think that you need more of it and some people will say it was abusive and those people who were guilty of it should be there what we can say is that it didn't stop bad behavior no no you know. and i think so what in 1950 there would have been greater autonomy for teachers there would have been mm -hmm. less pressure on teachers and therefore the people attracted to the profession arguably were a bit more valued perhaps not so patronized uh, um, do you think that's fair? I don't think if you listen, if you read, I'm trying to think of sort of books of the time that describe teachers. Um, obviously, um, J. L. Carr's whole Harpool report is later than that, but it's very yeah. much of that world. It's about that you know when Emma Foxborough comes into that book, she's the you know the the, the spirit of the '60s flowing into it. Until then, it's very much a 19 sort of '50s world. And teachers in that world do not feel valued. They don't feel respected. They don't, you know, the whole thing of the man with the key to the storeroom being of more power than the head teacher, you know? I don't think, and that's, I mean, that's in a state school thing, but then I think of like Alec Waugh's Loom of Youth, which I think is actually 30s, but, you know, again, you know, the teachers in that, they're not, I'm afraid I don't think there has been a golden age when teachers were, were respected. Humans. No, no, no. I don't. Know I think been... about my dad at school in the forties, and he was at school in a village school in a, in a quite a 
a remote and rural part of Essex. I know that sounds like a joke, doesn't it, rural Essex? But it was. My dad says when he was a kid, if they saw a car in the village, it was sufficiently interesting that you could talk about it for a fortnight. Um, <laughs> There's yeah. still some so, lovely rural bits of Essex. You know, out oh, around no, Saffron Walden and stuff. It's lovely. It's just I avoid it because I've got too much family there. Um, yeah. But, um, <laughs> he, yeah, he's, you know... He was at school in a little village school there. It was run by two old ladies who were not respected or regarded warmly in the community. They came in from outside to do the teaching. And um, oh, I don't think it was a... It certainly wasn't a gold. Yeah, I think when I, was getting into, when I was getting into role play last week and with my double-breasted suit and my pipe, and uh, obviously not a pipe in class, but, you know, pipe around the place, um, mm. I was romanticising about it a little bit and thinking that... that you know, there was, I know, I know there's a return to, in the in the educational zeitgeist, there's a return to sort of traditionalism, which of course was pretty rife in 1952. Um, mm. But, um, and I and I'm, you know, I've got a lot of kind of progressive tendencies. If, if you know, I don't really believe in the in the in the dichotomy myself anyway. So, but but I do think that. Uh, it was simpler and and perhaps more honest you know i think i think there's been a lot of initiatives of you know like trying to prove that children are engaged with their learning to try and make learning a little bit more exciting whereas actually you know if we think if you think about the rudiments of language and the rudiments of maths you know i've i've bought a, a, in, in national trust killerton secondhand bookshop a few years ago i bought a maths textbook an algebra maths textbook and it's a thing of beauty you know it's just it's mm-hmm. not got any pretty pictures or any color in it it's just you know the maths is the same it's not maths hasn't changed mm-hmm. in in 70 years particularly um i mean the lack of emphasis on the reduced emphasis on geometry and now we've got computer aided ed- ed- design and stuff perhaps changed a bit but but the the you know arithmetic's not really changed fundamentally in 70, 70 years whereas obviously a lot of the other subjects have enormously science curriculum will have changed enormously um a, a, quite a lot um but i think um you know that we try and whiz things up and make them exciting and and do group work and group work has its place we need to do group work but we could do group work in drama and do group work in in in, in you know this and that we don't have to do group work in every lesson every minute of the day you know, you know but, and sometimes it's just there is an element of you know, I'm going to just show you how this works on the board. You're going to copy it down, and then you're going to turn to page 23, and you're going to answer questions one to six. and And I might mark them, but I'm not going to be under <laughs> under, under any. We'll probably mark them together at the end of the lesson, and um, and then you know I might use the marking to inform the next lesson, but I probably won't. We'll just move on to the next page, and 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 if you can't keep up, you can't keep up. Tough. Um, mm. and I think. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's it. We're, we're now already nearly three minutes overdue. We haven't done oh, any no. music. Um, next week, I'm just thinking we do need to do something a little bit more frivolous. Um, yes. I think we should perhaps we'll talk doing. about some walks next week because we're going to go for a walk. We, we should talk about some, walk. some could... walks, some spring walks. Yeah. We did a special on winter walks, didn't we? Well, I guess so. Maybe we should talk about our favourite spring walks a bit next okay. week. But educationally, we could talk about what's your favorite term to teach in and you know the highs and lows of the summer term in school that sort of thing you know perhaps lucy wants to call in very briefly Mm. does she want to join in with the music i'm gonna let her join oh no come on lucy join try again ask again ask again lucy call in one oh there she is well hang on there we sent your invite lucy what do you want to say was that a mistake did you click it by mistake Sorry, Lucy can't join now. I think she clicked oh. that by mistake. Lucy, you oh. tantalised us. Um, right, Ed, we talked about the blues earlier on, a bit of Bo Diddley, something like that. Have you got anything like oh, that, God. Yuki? Um, um, no? Because I saw... Your, 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 not, it's not your really Diddley, Bow, but I saw, saw some... Ed has got a wonderful range of contraptions and guitars and, and, and yeah. very primitive Lots ones and some very beautiful ones in his house. What have you got? Um, I was thinking, I, uh, um, okay, here we go. Oh, I had a burp there. I hope that's all right. I hope that didn't come across on the radio, did it? My little burp. Um, no, I, I didn't hear it at all. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I'm drinking. Uh, do you know what? I like it very much. This um, uh, Blue Moon. You know the Blue Moon? 
Blue moon, I saw you standing alone. I don't know if it's Bo Diddley or not. Baby, please don't go. Baby, please don't go. Baby, please don't go don't down go. New Orleans. You know I love you so. Baby, please don't go. Before I be your dog. Baby, be your dog. Before I be your dog. I get you went out here. Baby, please don't go. Baby, please don't go. Have you got your uh, cord on here? I've got to turn it on. So yeah, I put new batteries on. in it because we we I did, over the last few evenings. Sing a lamb down low, baby, lamb down, down low, turn your lamp down low. I beg you all night long, baby, please don't go. You brought me way down here, make me roll down here, brought me bring down here, now I'm rolling for treat me like I'm dope, baby, please don't go. Did you get some corg on that, did you? Did you? Yeah, yeah, here. Oh, here it is. We played with this last night. Noise, isn't it? I think your your ukulele mm. and or your bluesy guitar. That was a more of a guitar than a ukulele, wasn't it, Ed? That was a guitar today, yes. That was a Spanish style nylon strung guitar, which was leaning up against the end of the sofa. Anyway, peeps. Right, well, you know, for half term, that was perhaps a little dry by our standards, but I still dry. think we had our chemistry. We had mm -hmm. our chemistry. We we perhaps, of course, we normally don't see each other, but we saw each other for 22 wonderful hours. And I'm looking forward to seeing you on Friday, Ed, for a walk out mm. at Heartland, I hope. Um, and um, next week, we might talk about highs and lows of the summer term and some walks and just general general you know how are we going to survive until the end of the summer term that sort of stuff yeah yeah yes man well right. i'll see you on friday for see you on walk. friday and um, thanks very much for, for listening chat. and thanks we've yeah. been nice to have christopher vowels in all evening and charlie richards and tim mycock and lucy von sock and a few other people dipping in and out and and thank you very much and all those of you listening back um Another big shout out at, before we go to the wonderful Rachel Higginson. Really lovely person. So lovely to meet you yesterday. Ed's met you a couple of times before. Really great. A new friend. Met through Twitter. And and um, yeah, big shout out. Lovely person. Great educationalist as well. So um, and thanks for listening. Everybody speak to you next week. See you on Friday, Ed. Bye. See you, mate. Bye. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.